what are governance tokens? This is a question that I tried to answer about a year ago with a previous Crypto Whiteboard 101 video, but I realized I can't describe everything that you need to know about governance tokens in only two minutes. So in today's video, I'd like to step back a little bit, give myself a little bit longer time frame, and explain what you need to know about governance tokens, how they are different than other forms of governance, and just really dig into what governance tokens are all about. So if you're looking for a video that is in-depth, but also beginner friendly, then this one is for you. Hey everyone and welcome. This is the Part-Time Economist and in today's video we are going to be taking an in-depth look at governance tokens, what they do, how they function, a variety of different things. So let's start with a basic definition here and of course I am using my sources so I will link them in the description just so I can give credit where it's due. But governance tokens are cryptocurrencies that represent voting power on a blockchain project. Quite simply, that is what a governance token is. It represents a voting power on a blockchain project. So if we think about cryptocurrency, right, a lot of what we hear is that cryptocurrency is decentralized, it's permissionless, right? But there are still governance structures in place. And that's something that really goes throughout all of society. Everything that we know has some kind of a governance structure. The US government, right? We've got the Senate, the House of Representatives, President, we've got the Supreme Court, right? companies. They're going to have a CEO, a board of directors, managers, district managers, various things like that. Cryptocurrency projects, even though they are decentralized, even though something like a Bitcoin or an Ethereum may be a decentralized network, the actual projects that are listed on those blockchains, they need someone to create them, right? They don't just materialize out of nowhere. So a lot of times what we see is when a new project, when a new cryptocurrency or blockchain protocol is launched, it will be developed kind of by that core team. They will put it out there, they will put it on the blockchain, and they're really the initial founders of that project. Now, at this point, they are kind of benevolent dictators over this project, right? They tightly control everything, they are bringing their idea, right, their contribution, and they are putting it out there for the world. At this stage in the game, it is their ideas, it is their code, they're going forward with it. Now, as time goes on, more people start to use it. It picks up steam. Some, but not all projects say, you know what? We want to turn the governance of this project over to our community. Now, here's the thing. They don't have to do that. You could create a cryptocurrency project, you could create a protocol, and you could be the exclusive owner of that protocol as long as you wanted. But many projects, many teams do turn over control to the users, to the community, and that is typically done through those governance tokens. So within a governance token, this is usually distributed to the community. Now, the way that governance tokens are distributed can vary widely, right? So different protocols, again, if you wanted to, you could keep your protocol, you could be the dictator for life, right? So the way in which you distribute your governance tokens, or if you distribute them all, is really up to the project. But I do want to highlight just a couple different projects and ways that they have distributed their tokens. Now, one thing I want to point out, when I mention specific projects or specific governance tokens, I am not endorsing them. I am also not saying they're bad. I'm simply using them as a point of illustration to show some of the historic ways that governance tokens as a general class have been distributed by citing specific examples. Now, according to this article here from Gemini.com, what it says is that governance tokens are typically distributed to platform users as a reward for using the protocol and cannot be initially purchased, though they may eventually later on trade on kind of exchanges, the secondary markets. And I'm just speaking from my personal experience. For example, I was eligible for the Uniswap airdrop and basically Uniswap said that anyone who had used their protocol before a certain date was eligible for a certain airdrop of their governance token, right? Um, another example that I have is the Splinterlands blockchain-based trading card game, right? I play this game, they distribute the governance token based on how many assets that you have in the game. So there's tons of different ways you can do this. Some protocols will do a one-time airdrop of their governance tokens. Some such as Splinterlands is literally dropping those airdrops of the governance token over basically a year-long period. So there's so many different ways in which the tokens can be distributed. But the key point is that most of the governance tokens are trying to distribute the majority of these tokens to people that have interacted with the protocol, to people that have an interest in the protocol. So most of the times, you're not just going to see governance tokens sent 
sent to random individuals, they're going to have some connection. Either they've used the protocol, they've interacted with the protocol in some way or another. So that's how governance tokens are distributed. And again, when you think of that, I want you to keep in your head the general idea is that we want to give these governance tokens to the community, to the people that are using the protocol, to the people that have a stake in the protocol. All right, very cool. So you've got these governance tokens now. What can they do and why do they matter? Governance tokens allow the users or the holders of those tokens to pr propose and implement changes to the protocol. So let's think of, for example, compound finance, right? This is a protocol that allows you to deposit cryptocurrency and the algorithm, the smart contract lends it out and gives you a way of earning interest. So one thing that users might want to change is the fee structure, right? So we might want to change the fee model. We want to enter different parameters into that. Maybe we want user interface changes, right? Maybe if we're playing the Splinterlands blockchain based game, we want a difference in the way that rewards are calculated, right? So there's really a variety of different things that these governance tokens can do. And the cool thing about them is that the community gets to vote on those changes, right? So in that respect, some people, and I've heard this question before, they're going to say, well, that sounds a lot about stocks, right? So if you think of holding a traditional stock, if I own equity in Coca-Cola, if I own equity in Microsoft, right? Traditional shares are associated with ownership, right? So that gives us the ability to vote perhaps for board of directors or various things. Again, this isn't a stock market course by any stretch. I'm just giving you the basics here. So people are saying, hey, basically a governance token is kind of like a stock in a cryptocurrency project. And to an extent, I can kind of see where that comparison falls. However, there are a few key differences that I do want to point out. And this is an awesome article here by Coinbase. It basically says governance tokens bear similarities to traditional equity, which I would agree with. However, there are also key differences. Governance tokens are restricted in scope and can only vote on a small set of parameters that are offered freely to users of the protocol and are sh strictly not equity in a legal sense. So when we think of governance tokens, yes, we can vote. We do have the ability to vote on changes to a protocol. However, the changes that we can vote on have already been pre-established for us. So I can't just say, hey, I have all these governance tokens. I want to turn compound finance from a lending protocol into uh, a blockchain based game, right? I, I can't really do that. With governance tokens, yes, it does give the community the ability to vote, but they're limited to a specific subset of basically agreed upon things that they can vote on. So again, this is where different uh, companies, different blockchain based platforms have their differences as to what you can actually do with those governance tokens. Not only do a different protocols distribute their governance tokens in different ways, but the rewards that you get for holding those governance tokens can be different as well. So some governance tokens, all you can really do with them is vote on the future of the protocol, right? And that would almost be like having a stock kind of that doesn't pay a dividend, right? You're just voting on the protocol and that's it. And you might say, well, why is that valuable? Well, again, I can't give you financial advice, but people may want a direction in the future of the protocol. So on the one hand, you've got those tokens that all they do, they're just for voting. They don't really have other than someone wanting to buy them to gain influence of the, over the protocol. They don't necessarily have anything in and of themselves. However, other tokens do. So if we take a look again here, awesome article on Medium. What I want to show you is that different protocols have different governance tokens with different reward structures. So compound finance. Currently, there are no rewards. Inflation rewards are proportionally delegated to all lending market participants. Let's check out a few more here. Um, we're looking at Uniswap. Again, currently no rewards. Equal share of inflation rewards are delegated to all accepted pools liquidity providers. But now I want to show you one that does have a reward, for example. So if we go down here and we check out, let's see, Curve Finance, I think. Inflation rewards and 50% share of the network fee is heavily weighted to Curve DAO stakers and then Kyber Network Crystals. Again, the names here don't matter. I'm not, inter you know, I'm not recommending either one of these over the other. I'm just giving you examples. So Kyber Network Crystals, network fee of 0.2% on all trades and then 65 to 70% of the network fee awards to Kyber DAO stakers. So the main point I'm trying to say here is that 
Different protocols will distribute their governance tokens in different ways, and the rewards for holding those tokens are also different. Some of them, all you're really getting is voting rights. Some of them, you're getting voting rights in addition to a form of passive cryptocurrency income. Now, with that being said, we've talked about these governance tokens in relation to kind of traditional stocks, traditional equities, how they are different. I also want to talk just a little bit about how do these things actually get implemented, right? Because we're talking, we're saying, hey, the community can vote on these proposals. The community can propose changes, right? Well, the way that this happens, again, I can't speak for all cryptocurrency projects or even all governance tokens, but what I can give an example is something that I am familiar with. So within the Compound protocol, and again, that's a decentralized lending platform, what you see is that these proposals are executable code. They are not suggestions for the team or for that foundation to implement. So and this is the important thing. If I've got 1% of the comp delegated to my address, I can propose a governance action. Now, this could be adding support for a new asset, changing a collateral factor, a variety of things. But the important thing is I need a certain amount of governance tokens to propose this. But I can't just say, hey, I want to uh, do this. I want to do that. And then expect some other developer to do it. As you see here, specifically with regard to Compound, and again, I'm not speaking for other protocols, proposals are executable code, not suggestions. So you're actually submitting a coded proposal. Now, all proposals are subject to a three-day voting period. Any address with voting power can vote against or for. If at least 400,000 votes and a majority are cast for the proposal, it is queued in time lock and can be implemented for two days. So the cool thing with this, what's really happening, you are submitting actual code. The decentralized process is voting on this. It's saying, hey, this is good or no, we don't want this. And then it goes into this process automatically. So you're not just suggesting to a developer to do something. The results are actually determined based on that decentralized voting structure, which is so cool because once you submit that, the amount of human intervention is quite low. Now, one last thing that I do want to compare governance tokens with are this concept of utility tokens. So when we think of utility tokens, governance tokens, it can be easy to get them confused, right? Because we think cryptocurrency, okay, I know what a cryptocurrency is. We hear governance token, utility token, it can be easy to get things jumbled up. So the key difference here is that when you think of utility, I want you to think of use, right? So again, this is just giving you an example here, but let's suppose that I'm operating on the Binance Smart Chain or the Ethereum network, right? In order to pay a transaction fee on the Binance Smart Chain, right? I'm going to have to pay that in BNB, right? It's the utility, it's kind of the access ticket that I need to operate on that network. If let's suppose we have a decentralized video streaming service, right? And let's just call that RobCoin. If I'm paying for that decentralized video streaming service, I'm paying in RobCoin, I'm paying to access a certain feature. So that's what I want you to think about when you hear the term utility. Um, it could kind of be thought, again, I'm gonna use an example that I'm relatively familiar with, Splinterlands, right? the dark energy crystal cryptocurrency, right? That could perhaps, not exactly 100%, but let's think of that as a utility token. I use it to enter into tournaments. I use it to buy new cards or packs, whatever the case may be. Now, by contrast, a governance token is something that conveys those voting rights and kind of control over the future direction of the protocol. So again, I'm playing Splinterlands, I'm earning my dark energy crystals, those help me in the game, but they don't determine the future of the game. That is reserved for the SPS governance token, right? So that is kind of the difference in what's going on. And again, this awesome article here has a great example of that. So governance layer, network governance, decision process, off-chain governance, community stuff, right? That is all within the governance layer. The utility layer is the actual use case. So if I'm going and I'm just using a protocol on a day-to-day -day basis, what the end user is actually seeing is gonna be more utility token focused. So just to wrap everything up, I know that was definitely a little bit longer of a video, but I really thought it was important to go a little bit more into depth about what governance tokens are, how they're different, and kind of just to sum everything up. Governance tokens at the most basic sense give users a level of control over the future of a cryptocurrency protocol. Now, the amount of control that each governance token gives is going to vary widely depending on the project and what parameters have been coded into that to allow the governance tokens to do. 
governance tokens are powerful, but they can't do everything, right? They can't completely fundamentally alter a protocol, right? They're limited to the things that they've been pre-coded to do. On top of that, the way that these governance tokens are distributed, again, hugely variable across different protocols. Sometimes it's a one-time airdrop. Some of those airdrops can be across several months. Some airdrops, everyone gets the same amount. Some airdrops, it is distributed proportionally based on how much you've interacted. So that varies. And then lastly, to make things even more, I don't want to say confusing because it's more about variability and customization than it is confusing because with the cryptocurrency governance tokens, everything is individualized. Kind of like cryptocurrency as a whole, right? We have so many different choices, so many different things of what we can use. The same thing, the people that develop these protocols, they have wide leeway in how they distribute their governance tokens and the rewards that come from holding those governance tokens. So like we talked about, some governance tokens, all they really do is allow you to vote. Other governance tokens, they entitle you to a share of passive income. So the one word to kind of take away from these governance tokens is it depends, right? How does a governance token work? What can a governance token do? What are the rewards for holding that? It all depends on the governance token. Just as there's thousands of different cryptocurrencies, there's tons of different governance tokens. And when you're considering a governance token, it's critically important to understand what does this governance token do? What are the rewards for holding it? And make the best decision based on your own individual research instead of just going into it with a set of assumptions that all governance tokens are going to be the same. So I hope this provided a little bit more clarity on governance tokens. I'd like to thank you for your time. Thank you for watching. Nothing is financial advice and I will see you next time.